In the brief lull, the Union took the opportunity to pull 7th Maine and 77th New York out of the battle line, replacing them with 2nd and 3rd Vermont, respectively. The battle lines in the distance as General Hill leads four regiments east along the Stockton Road. The withdrawing force can hear the battle restart as the Union troops once again assault the rebel lines. The fresh Vermont regiments are both partially obstructed and protected by a small copse of trees, as are the 6th Alabama and 2nd Florida. The resulting musketry is poor from both sides. No such obstruction on the hill as 27th New York and 96th Pennsylvania exchange fire with the 5th and 23rd North Carolina. All four regiments suffer hits, one which leaves the 5th North Carolina very close to breaking. Hampton's Legion Cavalry and the 9th Virginia Cavalry swarm around the hill in an effort to protect the flank of the infantry. 5th Maine followed by 16th New York halt to allow F Battery 5th US Artillery a clear field of fire into the left flank of the Confederate line on the Stockton Road. The damaged and retiring 7th Maine and 77th New York, relieved from the firing line, make for the rear and a well armed breather. G Battery, 4th US Artillery, get into action on the road. Looking across the field from the south of the farm. Troops blinded by smoke, cough, splutter and reload. Powder smoke and trees block the view of the firing lines on the Stockton Road as once more the artillery engage in a duel. F Battery, 5th US Artillery, failed to hit on their first flanking salvo. Bondarat's Battery score a hit on G Battery, 4th US Artillery, temporarily disabling it. On the hill, 27th New York and 96th Pennsylvania both suffer their first losses, but in devastating return fire against spasmodic and disorganised volleys by the rebels, secure numerous hits. This virtually destroys both 5th and 23rd North Carolina. Movement at the rear of the Union lines as relieved units move back and artillery and cavalry attempt to move forward. Looking north, across the Stockton Road and farm. Seeing the depleted and disorganised enemy regiments before him, Colonel Bartlett, Officer Commanding 2nd Brigade 1st Division, orders a bayonet charge by 27th New York and 96th Pennsylvania into the beleaguered 5th and 23rd North Carolina. For the rebels on the hill, the fat lady has already begun to sing. Looking east from behind the Union position. The surviving battered and beaten North Carolinians throw down their weapons in surrender. The left flank has fallen and in accordance with Brigadier Garland's orders, Hampton's Legion Cavalry and the 9th Virginia Cavalry have to withdraw east and attempt to join up with General Hill. Another volley of musketry on the Stockton Road. Both Confederate regiments are now down close to breaking point, but both manage a hit on the two Vermont regiments. The scene from the last stand of the 6th Alabama and 2nd Florida. On the hill, 27th New York and 96th Pennsylvania round up the rebel prisoners. 9th Virginia Cavalry, accompanied by Hampton's Legion Cavalry, hastily move east. They leave the battlefield behind. Brigadier Sam Garland knows the time has come. His two regiments are close to breaking, not to mention being exhausted. With the left flank now gone, he has little option but to surrender to prevent further pointless loss of life. With Union troops all around the Dixon farm, the Confederate position is now hopeless. 
They've done the job they were assigned by allowing part of the brigade to escape. 6 Alabama and 2nd Florida, along with Bondurant's battery, lower their battle flags and drop their muskets. Brigadier Sam Garland surrenders to Brigadier Brooks of 2nd Brigade, 2nd Division, US Army. A silence falls over the Dixon farm. General Franklin, Officer Commanding 6th Corps, and General Smith, Officer Commanding 2nd Division, agree to stand the men down for an hour to rest and take refreshments. There are still almost three hours of daylight left and both men are anxious to reach Crow Bridge before dark. The prisoners are also to be fed and watered, then put to work collecting wounded and burying the dead. Two depleted regiments will remain here to supervise the prisoners and erect a field hospital so the wounded of both armies can be treated. All cavalry are to move east to find, scout and report on the enemy. Now attention moves to the crossroads just south of the Crow Bridge. A pretty flat and featureless area with just the marshy area beside the Crow Bridge road of any real note. My interpretation of the table around the crossroads. Major General Danny Hill rode ahead of his force to the crossroads. He could see troops already on the move south on the Clanfield Road. Colonel George Anderson, O.C. of Anderson's brigade, rode forward to greet him. I'm pleased to see your brigade is on the move, George, Dan Hill said as he watched artillery limbers rumble along the crossroads. What's left of Sam's brigade is about a mile behind me, with the enemy two hours behind them. They'll be here by nightfall. George nodded. Sir, Brigadier Rhodes is holding the bridge. 5th Alabama and 12th Mississippi. Allow my brigade to withdraw in accordance with your orders. It is not much, but enough to hold the enemy for a time. We did manage to get the jump on them as our camp was out of their view. This allowed me to break camp, prepare my brigade, and move. The enemy only realized something was happening when our artillery batteries, in plain sight, began to limber up. Dan listened grimly. He had already lost Sam Garland. Sounded like he was about to lose Bob Rhodes, too. Very well, George. Keep your boys moving. I want the road clear for when my forces arrive. As darkness falls, I intend to make camp just north of Clanfield. After that, I'm still undecided. We can discuss that later. Fourth North Carolina, 14th Virginia, and Carter's Battery approach the crossroads. 27th and 28th Georgia lead the column heading south. The column hastens by General Hill and Colonel Anderson. The remainder of Garland's brigade home into view on the Stockton Road, 2nd Mississippi, 24th and 38th Virginia, along with the 12th Alabama of Rhodes Brigade. The sound of enemy artillery can be heard to the north, above the crunch of feet and wheels. Garland's brigade can be seen arriving from the west. They will follow Anderson's brigade towards Clanfield. 